We're here at Genscape. I'm joined in the room by my other uh, MISO analysts, Rush Milam and Stanley Tan. So they'll be helping out and taking your questions over the course of the broadcast. Again, please feel free to use the GoToWebinar to ask any questions that you may have over the course of the webinar. And again, we'll be distributing a copy of the presentation and the slides um, to everyone who's registered. So to start for today, um, and what we're looking at here, a uh, quick agenda. First, we're going to start with a recap of winter 2014 and the polar vortex year that was. Next, we're going to take a look at the weather and demand forecast for spring of 2014. Then moving on to a wind outlook and expectations for output there in both the west and the central regions. Then we're going to take a look at some generation changes, get into top constraints and the orca risk for spring, and then wrap it up with import export issues, especially as they come up with MISO and SDP, and then some changes to MISO and PJM. So winter 2014, quick review here. What we are seeing was a colder than normal winter developing across much of the Midwest, especially the upper Midwest. Uh, the anomalies that we were seeing were driven by persistent cold airflow into that region through the midwinter period. These were, again, gaining strength over the course of the winter, which has resulted in sustained well below average temperatures. Again, kind of um, peaking on January 6th here with that first round of polar vortexes. Uh, I'm looking at about 108.7 gigs on that peak day. We also saw heating degree days, or HDDs, uh, running above average levels throughout January and February uh, with some pretty decent spreads for those two months. Um, looking right. below here, looking at the departure from normal. Right. Your, your slides aren't moving forward. Can you make sure that you're not on pause? There we go. Um, so looking at the slides now, we haven't missed anything. We're on slide one. Um, so looking at the departure, what you're seeing is about a 15% departure from December, uh, and that holding true through January from Minneapolis. February, you're on 25%. And then moving into January and February, seeing that take off for Indianapolis and especially New Orleans in January. Looking at the average settles for winter 2014, December, January, and February, averages for December around 71.7, January getting up to around 91 gigs for the average demand, and then February around 88.5. Now looking at the strongest days um, of those months, uh, December, the top day around 91 gigs, January coming in at a 108.7 as we mentioned on January 6th, and then February coming in around 102. Now looking at the settles, um, seeing February really kind of post the most impressive around that 157 mark, but January not too far behind with that 85.5. Now looking at some of the top constraints that we saw over the winter and the day ahead, um, Fowler, Bloomington, and Newton Robinson rounding up the top three. Um, looking at the Fowler constraint, we saw outages around Westwood to South Prairie and Muschella to Reynolds. We're also seeing some strength in central zone wind generation during this time. The Bloomington, um, driven by worker on Oakland to Princeton, and then longer term work that we've been seeing at Bloomington Transformer, as well as strong output from some of the nearby coal fire units. Lastly here, looking at Newton Robinson risk, um, again, transmission work around Neoga itself, and then strength in nearby coal fire generation, while those western Indiana base load units remained weak. Um, now, with a lot of these being driven by some longer-term trends we've been seeing in the way generation has been running and some longer-term transmission work, um, there is a likelihood to see these constraints repeat um, into the spring uh, of this year. Moving on to the real time, uh, what you're seeing there, South Bend Blue Earth, uh, Bloomington Transformer, and then Reverse Orca running at the top three for the real time. Um, looking at about 5,700 um, five-minute ticks of that South Bend, uh, 5,600 of the Bloomington, and then around 4,700 of the reverse Orca. Um, now looking at the drivers there, the Bloomington driver remaining unchanged, but for the South Bend Blue Earth, you were seeing work at Lakefield and strength in western uh, MISO wind generation. Uh, and then the reverse Orca, what we were seeing there was some work around West Memphis to Keogh, and then again those cold temperatures in MISO South. Um, again, there is some likelihood to see these all continue, especially with the longer-term work around Lakefield 
and some strength in wind generation for the first half of spring 2014. So now moving into the seasonal demand and weather outlooks for the upcoming spring season. Um, looking at spring for temperatures, there is a risk to see normal temperatures for the south and parts of MISO north. However, around the Great Lakes and into Indiana and Illinois, you are looking at below normal temperatures, running about a degree or two colder than average. And then looking at the precipitation, uh, you may see a drier than expected area um, ranging from MISO north into Chicomet in Illinois. Um, not seeing those kind of uh, weaker levels of precip, though, uh, for that southern Indiana area, which caused some issues in 2012. Now looking at some historical weather trends, um, spring does offer that transition season from the heating load in the beginning, moving into the cooling load by the end of May. Um, again, we're expecting to see the cooling load hit first in MISO South and then move into MISO Central by late May. There is an expectation to see some of that extended cold, uh, especially for the North and Central, as our map alluded to, um, providing prolonged heating season and a little bit of delay in the cooling season expectations this year. Again, that's really kind of a buildup from the colder than normal winter we've been seeing so far and the threat of that pattern moving into the spring. Lastly here, looking at spring loads, typically weaker in comparison to summer and winter, obviously kind of lacking that extreme either heating or cooling, um, but you are looking at some cooling load growth accelerating into mid to late May. So now moving into the wind forecast. <clears throat> As you can see here, there is a slight decline, especially for that blue line representing MISO Central going into the back half of spring. You're also seeing some of that take hold from MISO North or previously West, um, but again, not to the same kind of extent. So in terms of looking at that capacity factor percentage, um, you are looking at um, between about 30 and 60 percent of percent uh, on average. Again, if wind does follow that historic pattern that we've been seeing, um, generation should begin to decline over the course of the spring, with May looking at the lowest levels of output. Um, you're also looking at a more severe drop in output levels in central versus the west historically, and again, the west now north, reducing the risk of congestion around the longer term work around Monticello especially. Um, so looking at the percentage capacity here broken out by region historically, um, what you're seeing there is by May, we're usually getting down to that 25% um, level or so on average in the central zone. May, you're getting down to closer to around 40 and 45% um, from the higher levels you're seeing, especially in March and April. Now moving into some additional generation analysis, um, looking at the interconnection queue for some new builds onto the grid. Um, one we were seeing here, um, partially online already, um, some wind generation build out again in the southern Michigan around Huron, uh, a new 150 megawatt farm coming online. As I mentioned, half of it already in operation as of December, the remainder slated to come online by May or June of this year. So now we're going to take a look at the top constraint risk for spring 2014, and I'm going to pass it over to Rush to walk us through our top five. So this first constraint here. Um, a pretty familiar area right there around uh, Lafayette, Indiana. We're looking at that Honey Creek, Honey Creek tap constraint. Now the drivers with this one are pretty similar. Uh, as you can see, most of these outages have already um, begun. Um, but we're seeing a switch from the Monticello East Winnemac constraint that's been um, appearing recently. As Lauren mentioned, that was one of the top constraints uh, for the winter. I know it was posting today. Um, but really change coming into this Honey Creek, Honey Creek tap is we're counting on some of those nuclear units being back in Michigan, as well as some other generation to the north of that constraint coming back online. Um, so you see less of those flows going south and north, and you get a little bit more of this Honey Creek tap congestion, which is actually uh, a little bullish on Indy Hub. The next constraint uh, we're calling for is Michigan City Laporte. Now with this, we're looking at a, an outage that began here on the 24th of this month. It's Michigan City to Maple. Now the past couple of days with this constraint, we've been seeing that Crete-St. John congestion, uh, primarily there over the morning. We're thinking you'll see a change as we go in a little bit later um, into spring as some of those units that I mentioned for that Monticello come back online. 
uh, especially some of those right there in NIPSCO. So you start to see more of this Michigan City Laporte. Um, this is the greatest risk over the morning hours. Um, just looking at a pump storage unit there in western Michigan when it starts filling those reservoirs, so mainly an off-peak risk for this constraint. Following this up, we're going to MISO South, and we're looking at uh, the Independence Transformer there in northern Arkansas. There's some longer-term work at Calico to Melbourne, um, which is actually out through the first part of July. Um, but with this, we're also looking at a few generation changes, um, expecting some baseload units to come back online there um, in MISO South, which could change this pattern up and start seeing a little bit more of that congestion around Arkansas Hub. Up next, uh, this is another really familiar area. Um, a lot of congestion there recently, and we're going to that Tumwa area in southern Iowa. So there are several outages currently in the area, and you know, we've seen a variety of constraints in the past few days. Um, a Tumwa Pello, um, you've seen some Lucas congestion, all of them bear stare on that A Tumwa node. Well, going into April, there's a parallel line outage at A Tumwa Pello. Um, the past several times that we've seen this congestion, we, we do see that parallel line congestion. Um, there's also an outage going through the first part of April. This is actually starting tomorrow, and it's that Wapello to Avenues. Um, so just for adding pressure to this um, constraint. Next up, uh, we're going to uh, Meister North and looking at the Lime Creek Transformer. There's um, a couple of outages. You'll have one going in there in April and also in May, and it's Lime Creek to Emory. So with this, we do see a lot more congestion at that Lime Creek Transformer. Um, so you'll see that kind of flips sometimes when you see the stronger wind days versus the weaker wind. So we're really looking at not only the wind in the area, but also some of that gas to see when it kind of comes on some of those days and start to see that congestion pattern reverse. So another one to keep an eye on. All right. So then moving into um, one of the more prevalent constraints we've seen recently, and that's that orca congestion, either the south to north and north to south coming in. Um, looking at our temperature spreads from last year and our threshold in order to kind of determine that congestion. And kind of what we're looking at is a couple of um, dependent features here. You have to have a cold Midwest. You have to have some cold in the south in order to get some of those gas-fired units up and running. Um, so what we're kind of looking at there is some potential to see that orca into the kind of late spring, uh, I should say late March in that early spring season. Now looking more recently at our charts so this year, um, based on the demand and temperature expectations, we're really not seeing that threat coming up over the course of the next couple weeks. However, what we are seeing instead is light cold in the area, but more so the loss of nuclear generation in MISO Central helping to contribute to that congestion risk. Additionally, if we see any light risk lingering around that kind of wind-driven congestion, excuse me, generation in May, um, and the decline there, you may see a little more of that push south to north um, as we're also expecting to see those south loads start picking up before we start seeing the, the kind of load picking up in the Midwest. So then moving on to those import-export issues that I alluded to, first touching on the MISO SPP themes. So what we're looking at here is the kind of dispute that we've been seeing pop up between SPP and MISO. At the heart of the issue um, is Section 5.2 of the MISO-SPP Joint Operating Agreement, or JOA. Um, SPP files with FERC that flows between MISO Central and South um, should be limited to the firm 1,000 physical megawatt uh, tie line between the two regions within MISO. Um, now, that is against what's outlined in the ORCA agreement or the Operational Reliability Coordination Agreement, which puts that first phase um, for the energy integration at a flow limit of 2,000 megawatts. In reaction to the perceived violation, SPP then sent MISO an invoice for the amount it believed MISO owed for unauthorized and unreserved use of the SPP transmission system. MISO then countered saying that it's not a market participant of SPP, and therefore SPP cannot bill it, uh, especially because as an RTO, um, it, it, it goes against kind of the unreserved use of charge application that SPP is arguing. So looking at the next steps, 
Um, MISO continues to operate under that phase one of the ORCA agreement, so that's that 2,000 megawatt limit we've been seeing. MISO in the future had also planned to see limits there increased, um, but again, this current kind of tie up and, and dispute between the two regions may hinder the growth of that limit flow. Um, both MISO and SCP filed to FERC uh, and are currently working on updating um, their MOU um, and which may result in some changes to that joint operating agreement as soon as June 1st. Part of that change means that both MISO and SBP are going to be need to be consistent in the way they're calculating the impact of transactions internally, um, but that does not mean that both MISO and SBP have to do so in the same way. Um, the two RTOs have outlined three different acceptable ways to calculate these um, transactions. Um, these three methods are the marginal zone method, the point of receipt, point of delivery method, and the slice of system method. Now, from some of the documents from MISO more recently, it does look like MISO is going to be using the marginal zone method uh, of calculation. Um, MISO is also going to be required to post this method and its calculations on the website in order for participants to follow the calculations. Um, given the discrepancy we're seeing uh, about the amount of flow that MISO South and Central are assumed to have, we're going to continue that for the time being and potentially into the summer season. MISO is going to continue to operate under that 2,000 megawatt limit, um, so we could continue to see that Orkin congestion both in the, the south to north and north to south direction um, post and expect to see that into the spring and summer, especially as those load levels begin to pick up. Also, to take a quick note here, um, we are going to be introducing an FPP Power IQ product in the near future, prior to summer. <clears throat> so for anybody who's been watching FPP closely, been watching this disagreement between the two RTOs closely, uh, we're going to offer that full service Power IQ. Um, we're going to have a full staff of analysts to answer your questions. And if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with the head of the FPP desk, Steve Maestranzi. Um, his email is here. Um, but if you need him more directly, um, we can hook you up uh, via MISO Genscape IM. So then getting into the other side of MISO and the flows between MISO and PJM. Um, here we're seeing um, the transactions, especially between the two regions, essentially getting double charged um, for the congestion that we're seeing on the scene. Um, so what we're looking at here is a way to kind of relieve some of that redundancy in the current setup. Um, so as you see the chart here, the MISO constraint kind of gets counted on both the MISO and PJM sides on this chart here on the left. What the comment interface definition is going to do is set up essentially one point um, that MISO will pay and charge transactions to, and then from that point into PJM, PJM will be responsible for covering that side of the constraint. Um, so again, that is going to alleviate some of that double counting. Um, what we're also expecting here um, is some of that double payment to stop, and it may also reduce the total amount of congestion seen between MISO and PJM, um, as that constraint may only post on one side or the other now. Uh, again, this isn't anything firmed up just yet. There are a couple proposals out on the table right now, um, so this is something we will be following in the future, as it may change some of those themes agreements between MISO and PJM. But that does kind of wrap up our overall summary here. Um, what we're seeing right now in summary, um, looking at a much colder than normal winter, helping to kind of prolong some of that heating into the spring. Um, so again, just watching that MISO north, especially the upper Midwest, um, for some of those below normal temperatures. Additionally, what you're looking at are overall wind levels expected to start dropping off, especially as we make it our way into May. Um, with more historical kind of generation starting to come offline, um, especially in MISO Central. Um, looking at, again, some of those springtime constraints that we reviewed, um, our top picks here for the season are Honey Creek to Honey Creek Tap, the Michigan City LaPorte, the Independence Transformer, Otumwa Wapello, and Lime Creek Transformer. Again, we're also looking at some of that diminishing orca risk. Now that's that south to north push. We don't want to discount any congestion risk around reverse ORCA. Um, so again, just kind of primarily looking at south to north congestion there. Lastly here, uh, may change in the works here for MISO and the way it will be handling some of its transactions with neighboring regions. 
In PJM, you're going to be looking at some changes on that common interface. And then in SBP, looking at some changes to that joint operating agreement, which could result in some ongoing congestion between the Midwest and South regions should that ORCA limit not be increased as a result. So again, that concludes this afternoon's prepared slides. Um, I do see a couple questions here, so we're going to go ahead and take a minute to review those. Um, and again, if you do have any, please feel free to send it uh, via that GoToWebinar. All right, thank you for the questions that have come across. Um, first, we have this question on ORCA. Um, I had mentioned that we were looking at some of the cold in MISO South as the driver, as opposed to more of the cold in MISO, uh, the Midwest, and if I could elaborate on that. Um, so what we're kind of looking at there um, in our expectations is that you need to see enough demand build in MISO South in order to get some of that generation kicked online. Um, then you're starting to look at some of that excess capacity moving northward. Now we saw that during the polar vortex um, with cold in my, uh, the MISO south as well as the Midwest region. We were also looking at some of those disparity between gas pricing, um, that Henry Hub level gas staying relatively low versus what you were seeing in the Midwest. Um, and then as I also touched on, uh, we're currently seeing some of that, again, not demand driven here, but more on the um, supply stack side. Uh, what we're seeing is some of that gener nuclear generation at Grand Gulf ramping up and a lack of nuclear generation making its way back in a timely fashion um, in the Midwest. So you're seeing a little bit more of that push here as well. Um, now our assumption is that those two nukes, the Grand Gulf and the Clinton nuke, will be back fully operational by summertime, but it is just interesting to watch some of those surrounding um, units uh, for any kind of trips, um, any kind of unplanned work that you might see coming up. Uh, which may impact those flows. So again, we're looking at demand, but we're also looking at that generation side of things and helping to kind of drive that congestion. The next question was um, regarding the changes to that comment interface, and we said that we were looking at a reduction in potential congestion um, to elaborate on some of the constraints that you may see um, impacted. Um, what we're primarily looking at is the congestion anywhere along that kind of Indiana um, AP border. Um, so constraints such as Breed Wheatland, um, Bunsenville Eugene, and some of those potentially wind-driven constraints in northern Indiana around Monticello as well. Um, so all of those kind of constraints to watch for um, and potential changes uh, when we do see this finally kind of submitted um, and, and accepted here. Um, so again, another kind of round of changes to watch for there, um, a lot of interface changes. It does look like any changes as a note that MISO SPP are doing with their JOA is also being adopted by the MISO PJM JOA um, to keep things consistent uh, along the MISO borders. So again, um, nothing firm to hear um, just as of yet, but it does look like they're looking for a June 1st change deadline. Um, so we will keep you posted as we move forward. Um, but let me just take one more minute. I think we have one or two more questions. Um, one second. So just one last question here was um, which method um, it looked SPP was going to be taking in terms of the changes there. Um, MISO does look like they're preferring that marginal zone method um, for calculations and it also looks like PJM may be adopting that as well and that's going to be taking kind of a proportional factor of the megawatts generated between regions. 
Um, the point of um, what SVP looks like we'll be doing is that point of delivery, point of receipt um, method. Um, so that's much more in line with what we're currently seeing them do as well. Um, but that was really all the time we had here uh, for questions. If you do have any that do come up over the course of your day, if you think of anything, please feel free to follow up with us on MISO Genscape uh, via IM or via email. Um, my contact information is L-S-E-L-I-G-A at genscape.com.